of this paper is to analyze briefly two complex archaeological problems with important historical consequences, which are usual and, in my opinion, unjustified, discussed separately. Dramatic changes of settlement pattern at the turn of the 13th century BC in Crete and the contemporary political and social disturbances in Cyprus and the Levant connected to large-scale migrations. The question is whether these problems are related to each other and whether the settlement changes in Crete can shed some light on the character, more than origins, of the peoples involved in the political and social crisis as recorded in the New Eastern and Egyptian texts, both on the regional and inter-regional level. The title of, uh, of this paper has been provoked by my discussion with Vernon Nav regarding the art article by Nav and Manning entitled Crisis in Context, The End of the Late Bronze Age in the Eastern Mediterranean, published in the American Journal of Archaeology in 2016. In the introduction of this paper, the authors pointed that, quotation, this article reviews the current state of the archaeological and historical evidence. The end of the quotation. In the open forum link to that paper, I expressed my reservation to that statement in my comment I wrote. Unfortunately, this is yet another paper which entirely ignores the most important part of archaeological evidence relevant to the subject, namely settlement patterns, settlement changes, and relocations of habitation sites, which took place in the coastal regions of the East Mediterranean around the time of the 1200 BC collapse. Please look at the dramatic changes of settlement pattern in the South Aegean if you want to understand the historical background of Ma Palekastro and Pilakotnokovic. Nap's response to this very particular remark went far away from the point and moved the, the discourse to the endless and, in my opinion, pointless argument about superiority of theory over evidence. He wrote, what Nowitzki implies, of course, is that he wants archaeologists to take one specific, narrow, and outmoded theoretical perspective and use this rather than question, explore, and critic both data and theory and consider holistically plausible interpretation. No, it was not what I had questioned. <laughs> and I cannot accept the use of a theoretical approach concept as a kind of a universal cover for the obvious weakness of the arguments in respect of evidence. Not argued that I was dealing with individual trees, whereas he and Manning were interested in the understanding of the entire forest. But the methodological question is, can we understand the forest not describing, not paying attention to individual trees? Can we ignore entire groups of trees when describing the forest? My position in this debate was that whatever theoretical model is applied in archaeological research, it must not be in disagreement with archaeological evidence. And in some cases, it doesn't make sense to create models if the evidence is too limited. During the last 35 years of my field investigations in Crete, I encountered similar fragment conflicts between two kinds of hypothesis construction. The first, created mostly from the principles of some theoretical approaches with a little care of archaeological evidence, and the second, built on relevant database with substantial new evidence identified as the result of targeted searching related to the research problem with the theoretical approach adjusted to the available and potential evidence. This latter kind of approach is especially important in studies of settlement. Let me allow to give you two examples taken from my own research. The first, the transition between the Neolithic and the early Bronze Age in Crete was until as late as the 1990s analyzed on the basis of maximum 10 open-air sites. Searching for new evidence resulted with a gazetteer of over 220 sites. There is no theoretical approach which could replace this missing evidence, especially in searching for the role of large-scale migrations during that period. And the second example relevant to this paper is the 1200 BC collapse. Also, the excavations in the early 20th century revealed the phenomenon of so-called refuge sites the research on the subject, which would include a precise chronology, the scale of the relocation, and the links with the previous settlement systems, didn't progress much when I started my fieldwork in the early 1980s. Only a few sites were added during the four decades after Pemberg's excavations at Carfi in the late 1930s. 
The chronology of the sites excavated or identified by surveys was muddled all the time, and the relation between the late Manual 3b and 3c settlement patterns was the darkest part of this so-called Dark Age. However, despite the fact that so many new sites were identified and published in the 1980s and 1990s, the real influence of this new evidence on theoretically orientated debates on the 1200 BC crisis in Crete is still minimal. One reason is that the complex results of fieldwork concerning numerous aspects of the phenomenon of settlement relocations in Crete are commonly simplified to only one conclusion, which is there were many defensive sites in Crete founded around 1200 BC. As already mentioned, this paper's aim is to explain how the settlement changes in the period in question in Crete can be linked with the roughly contemporary people's movements around the Aegean and farther to the east. My field research was not to bring an answer to the question of the causes for the political collapse of the Aegean states, but was to reconstruct the historical character of the events and processes which were the consequences of this collapse. The dramatic changes which started in Crete between the circa 1240 and 1230 BC and culminated around 1200 BC influenced enormously the life of all groups of people inhabiting Crete at that time. The abrupt relocations of the most of the island's population, showing extreme concerns about security, cannot be interpreted as a response to climatic changes in their social unrest or economic modifications. On contrary, regional wars, invasions, freebooting, piracy, kidnapping for slavery should be considered as the direct causes for the scale of settlement changes. It was obvious that this historical background was not restricted to the sea around Crete only, but must have affected, perhaps with some delay, other regions of the eastern Mediterranean as well. Max's comment, therefore, about the lack of relevance between the disturbances in Crete and Cyprus is difficult to defend. And uh, Max's quotation, we know that numerous but nearly all extremely small and mainly inland defensible, defensible sites, two mistakes about the extremely small and mainly inland, noted by Nowitzki, would offer an interesting issue for the long-term settlement history of Crete, but we don't see how the changes of settlement locations and the roughly contemporary crisis and collapse in the East Mediterranean are actually directly relevant as to the cause versus the secondary result, perhaps to the rather different situation in the East Mediterranean. Here, I will propose, therefore, the evidence based on how settlement crisis and collapse on Crete at the end of the Bronze Age, can be read together with the 1200 BC collapse in the East Mediterranean, as recorded in written texts and indicated by archaeological evidence such as from Mahale, Castro, and Pilar, Kokinokramos. It doesn't mean, of course, that the crisis in the South Aegean caused the collapse in the East Mediterranean, but it reflected the early stage of a domino effect of political disintegration and population movement, which soon afterwards <coughs> affected the regions east of the Aegean. Without the collapse of the security system in the Aegean, the history in the regions east of it might have followed a bit different path. To answer how different would be, however, a pure speculation. The case of Crete, because of an advanced research on settlement during the period in question, <coughs> gives us a unique opportunity to reconstruct the character of the people of different sides of the conflict and their plausible origins. It can also illuminate other problems such as <coughs> aggressors' intentions, if they had them, and destinations, and how long the particular phase of the process lasted, <coughs> and what were the most important, long-lasting outcomes of the crisis. Before moving to the presentation of settlements themselves, it is necessary to stress two points which are fundamental in this work. Studies of settlements are not limited to one particular period of interest. I cover a long sequence of settlement history, at least from circa 4000 BC to the 10th century AD. Thanks to such a broad approach, the changes of individual settlements, location and topography, as well as the organization of settlement systems and settlement patterns can be better understood. They reveal not only human adaptation to natural environment, as it was the case during some periods, but also a role of human factors, especially competitions between different groups of people, continuous or occasional inner conflicts, 
Innovations with the aim to settle down or see rates of more or less piratical, uh, piratical nature. Conflicts between groups of people could lead to long distance migrations or forced relocations within the same region from open and easily accessible places to defensible by nature or defensive by fortifications locations. The character and length of travels caused by human factors determine the choice of a geographic zone, the scale and distance of relocations. Here we have two, two systems, uh, defensible sites of the final Neolithic period marked with blue and the 13th, 12th century BC marked with red. And we see that how different zones, the same model of defensible sites were occupied. And the second point, certain analysis cannot be restricted to a few excavated sites. The latter should be combined with other elements of the settlement system and should be starting points to intensive searching for other missing elements of the system. The presentation of the problem of defensible settlements in Crete around 1200 BC was usually limited to a few excavated sites, as for example Kalfi. But each of these sites interacted with its suburb, suburb, periphery, hinterland, and other landscape elements. In the vicinity of each of the mentioned sites were other settlements of similar characteristics, following similar pattern and representing the same historical circumstances. But nobody searched for them. When I came in 1983 to study the first and the most famous site of this type, Karfi, uh, which was basically discussed and presented in isolation, the first which I, which I realized was uh, that just across the valley there is a very similar rocky knoll, uh, you can see on this uh, photo, and the, my first uh, target was that to check what was there. And there was the settlement contemporary to Karfi, a bit smaller, but exactly the same and, and the characteristic defensive sites located on the similar rocky knoll. And then I, I checked other elements and I found more and more sites which were relevant, which were either contemporary or represented the elements of the settlement system immediately before or immediately after. Now I can say that just around Karfi are at least 20, 24 <coughs> sites which are relevant and Karfi cannot be understood, uh, understood without analyzing these sites around it. Uh, so, having this example of Carfi, I don't believe that in Cyprus there are no other sites similar to Mapa Lecastro and Pelakotinokromos. And the interpretation of them in an isolation from the whole settlement defensive system reminds me the interpretation of Carfi in Crete until the 1980s. One of the most important outcomes of this research was working out the chronological sequence of settlement collapse with individual phases which reflected the changes in historical circumstances within and around the South Aegean. These are phase one, the crisis, covering the last four of the three decades of the 13th century BC, phase two, the collapse, covering the last years of the 13th century, and the, first, and the first 30 to 50 years of the 12th century, and phase three, the recovery, which started somewhere around the middle of the 12th century and continued for the next few centuries. The first two phases are particularly important for the understanding the historical process which characterized the crisis in the East Mediterranean, and they should be analyzed in conjunction with archaeological and historical evidence concerning the settlement collapse in Cyprus. To understand the scale of settlement changes in Crete during this period, we should be reminded that the principles of settlement patterns in Bronze Age Crete were founded during the transition between the last final Neolithic phase and the early Bronze Age I period. It is between 3300 and 2800 BC. These principles were established as the result of large-scale migrations from beyond Crete and the following negotiation and or conflicts with the native population and an adaptation to local environment in very particular historic circumstances within and around Crete. What happened later were only minor and or regional modifications which included a better exploitation of natural resources and short-lasting responses to tensions and conflicts between individual territorial units or states or external threats. 
The major settlement centers, however, as they were founded at the end of the 4th and the beginning in the 3rd millennium BC, continued almost uninterrupted through the next two millennia. What happened at the end of the 13th century was without precedence and had its enormous consequences, speaking of settlement patterns, at least until the Roman period, and in some regions until the second half of the 20th century AD. Now we can move to the presentation of archaeological evidence regarding individual settlement locations and organizations of settlement systems in two of the mentioned already phases, crisis and collapse. The third phase, the recovery, is less relevant to the issue um, and I, which I discussed in this um, paper. In the 14th and the first half of the 13th century, Crete enjoyed a period of peace and prosperity. That's the picture we can conclude from the settlement pattern. Then, probably during the last four or three decades, the situation becomes unclear. Limited destructions of villages and towns and decrease of population, gradual or sudden abandonments of entire regions characterize this period. The question arises, what happened to the inhabitants? Did they leave Crete voluntarily or taken as slaves, were killed or fled to safer places in the mountains? When looking for the direct causes of this settlement collapse, it is not enough to examine the very evidence testifying the collapse itself. We have to analyze the responses of the people to different <coughs> kinds of crises before and after our collapse. The conclusion of such an extra extended analysis is that the only direct reason for the shift of settlements to defensive locations was the collapse of the security system, not within Crete itself, but at least within the Aegean and Libyan seas. The sites were located at defensible places because of a direct security threat coming from the sea. One of the crucial but most important point in the reconstruction of the late 13th century settlement crisis in Crete is the identification of the people responsible for the security problems. How is it possible that the enemy who caused such a havoc is almost invisible? Among the plausible answers, two seem to be worth of consideration. What the first, the enemy comes from the same ethnic, political and cultural group, then the material culture left by the aggressors would be difficult to recognize. And the second possibility, the enemy didn't leave any evidence because, although active around, it didn't stay for long in the land of those suffering from their activity. To identify this kind of enemy, we have to look at the available evidence in a different way than in the case of wars between political units or invasions with the aim of seizing the land. Historically speaking, we may deal with the situation in Crete somewhat similar to that in the second half of the 7th century AD, after the first incursion of the Arabs into the East Mediterranean. Let's have a look, therefore, at the very special categories of archaeological sites which can be dated to this phase, phase one, the crisis, so probably late in it. The first is a fortified citadel, something almost unknown in Crete in any earlier period. The sites are usually located on rocky ridges with one or more sites defended by a cliff and the access of the sites were closed with a thick fortification wall between two and three and a half meters thick. They were situated either at the coast or close to it. One site was built on the coastal promontory. And now I want to show you several examples of such um, fortified citadels, reminding a little bit the Mycenaean citadels, which were unknown before in Crete. Here is the first one, Catocastolas, which is situated in the gorge, or Zacros Gorge, um, just a, a half an hour in the walking distance. Uh, from the, the, the coastal the area of Zacros, which was long occupied between the final Neolithic and the end of the Bronze Age. And here we, we have the fortification wall of this, of this site. Here we have the position, uh, the, the, air, the, the air view, the position of this fortified citadel and the coastal plain of uh, Kato Zacros. Uh, more uh, uh, better now is the site Castrokefala on the western edge of the, Irak, uh, of the Iraklian Bay. Uh, here you can see the position and the fortification wall. Here is the Google uh, Earth and the, uh, view. Uh, the, dark, uh, the dark arrow shows the very small part was excavated by Athanasia Kanta and uh, uh, some of this stuff was published. 
the, 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 the line of the fortification wall, and the, the, the white arms shows the rows of buildings, unexcavated buildings, which remind the, 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 the pattern, the, 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 the plan, reminds a little bit these rows of buildings in Pelagotinopremos. And one more of these citadels, it is the Yuktas, um, um, uh, one hour walking distance south of Knossos, and here the, the, the Google view. Uh, that wall was just enclosing the, the most um, holy place in Crete, in uh, Bronze Age Crete, the peak sanctuary on Yuktas. Uh, and then less now the wall in, in, in uh, Kritza Castello, um, Eastern Crete, the Gravel Bay. Here you can see the remains of this wall. Uh, another wall was identified uh, on the eastern side of Carfi. And here we have the relation with the excavation part of Carfi by Pendlebury and the new of the, the trenches by, by Sir Wallace and the position of the wall mark with the white <coughs> the, the arrows. One more the, 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 the citadel of this kind, Orne, uh, in Western Crete, the Retinon district, uh, north of the Messala Bay. And in the wall, as it is preserved now. And now, a, a especially interesting site, which was identified by Barbara Haydn, uh, Elias Tonisi. Here we have the relation between Elias Tonisi and just before I showed you this Kritza Castello on the side. Elias Tonisi, um, the promontory, which was uh, shut by the heavy, uh, the thick fortification wall. Across here, we can see on the lower, uh, the lower picture, the white line shows the position of the fortification wall, and on the upper, uh, the top picture, you can see the location of this peninsula. Uh, and here, the similarity between the location of Elias Tonisi in Crete and Mataleka in Cyprus. Both uh, they were occupied the central, the middle uh, peninsula with two um, uh, uh, very good natural harbors on both sides. And here we have uh, the a bit similar, but relying more <coughs> on the natural defensibility in, 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 in characteristics, the promontory sites, Palekastrokastri, and very similar site uh, which uh, was identified on the western coast of uh, Karpatos. And here again, uh, the, the lower picture shows, shows Mulas and Karpatos in the relation to slightly later, but also defensible uh, peninsula Arkansas and Karpatos. And the, the top view, it is the western end of, of Crete, and Falasa on the, the side similar to Palikastro Castri, but shorter uh, 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 during the shorter period. And one more here. Now I want to move up, um, uh, to another category of the sites which are especially important for the interpretation of who were the enemies and what was the, what the relocation or migrations meant for the Cretans. These are the extremely defensive sites in Crete. We have uh, several of them. One was excavated, that is the Catalimata in the Hard Arch. You see the location of the natural uh, ledges uh, on the cliff. Uh, here is the excavated house. Uh, you can see um, how it was arranged. Just a small terrace with a precipice uh, on the three sides, and one side was the cliff um, uh, rising above. And here the you have the reconstruction of the houses, and once again the location of the, of the site. And here we have the view from uh, Catalimata to the, to the coast, uh, which shows also the position of the pre-crisis and pre-collapse uh, settlements in Vasiliki, Burnia, uh, Pachiamos, these red, red circles. And here, even more difficult uh, the site to climb, I couldn't climb it by myself, I always needed some help, is just uh, the, the top of this rocky knoll. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, there are some uh, remains of, of walls, so there were houses built up there. Uh, and at least three periods, I, ident I identified three periods. Late minor 1b, late minor 3c early, and early design time. And one more. That is the site um, on the southern coast, Kutsunari Karfi. Uh, again, um, 
well visible houses, so it's not just the temporal refuge site <coughs> that people use occasionally. No, they were properly built houses on the top of this rocky knob. Uh, here we are on the southern coast, and the southern coast needs a special explanation because southern coast is very important and the differences between northern coast and southern coast of Crete may uh, help us to understand what was going on. Uh, the southern coast never entirely recovered after the destructions of the palaces in the middle of the 15th century. But there was some activity, nevertheless, there was some activity closer to the sea through the 14th and 13th century. But at the end of the 13th century, there was absolutely nothing. It was abandoned and people were mad, were crazy. They were just moving up to the highest mountains, to the highest peaks, to rocky knolls. Uh, and what was also important, their visual relation between them and the coast. They really controlled what was going on on the coast and on the sea around. And you see the, 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 the two examples, Nipefki and Mithi Mirthos. And then the, the two more examples. And here, uh, the Retinon district, uh, we have Kefali and Kirimianu. These are the main uh, refuge defensible uh, settlements. Uh, from the end of the 13th and very early 12th century BC. And you see that the coast, which we have on the left, was completely abandoned. The coast, which was inhabited uh, for 2,000 years before, was completely abandoned and people moved to the, the highest uh, summits of the, of, the, of the mountains. What is interesting, these are the views from this refuge defensible in the 13th, 12th century BC uh, sites. And what I mark with these with this, um, uh, black areas, the black areas are the areas where we had very numerous defensive final Neolithic settlements. So we see the, the relation. The, uh, the final Neolithic defense of the settlements were very close to the sea. Here and now we are very far away from <coughs> following the, the, the sea and the coast uh, around. Uh, one of these um, early um, 12th century BC is the refuge size on the top of this mountain. And one more. That's, it, it, the site is quite imp important to, to understand um, also the weakness of the evidence base. The area was intensively surveyed by the, by the Jenny Moody team, the Svatya survey, and they, they, they declared that the area was abandoned in, in, at the end of the 13th century BC. So I asked them, can I have a look? And I went there and I uh, climbed the, the, the hill, which seemed to be the best uh, to check. And there is a very large settlement in the 12th century, the end of the 13th century and 12th century, at least three hectares for Cretan standard is very big. Um, and here we can see it, and then the view, the Google view, um, and the whole ridge, which is K and this below, all the, the whole ridge is the settlement with some kind of walls, but walls, fortification walls are really closed only the most accessible places uh, which could be which could be which could be simply climbed. And one more site, it is uh, mm, the site uh, under the Prophetis Elias, the south again southern coast um, uh, western very western part of, of uh, Crete. Uh, this extremely defensible sites, which I showed you before, defensible by nature, all cliffs and in, in, inaccessible rocks were very characteristic for this transition between phase one and phase two. The excavated from Catalibata and surface material indicates that these sites were founded only between the very end of the phase one and the very beginning of phase two, and not later. In absolute days, the most plausible is the period around 1200 BC plus minus. The presence of late minus 3 B data the evidence is still substantial, but the majority must be classified in LM3 C. The extreme defensibility, together with a short lifetime, indicate that they were founded in the worst insecure time. Their location cannot be explained in any other way. Additionally, some of them were occupied again in the early Byzantine period when we can combine archaeological evidence with historical sources illuminating the true character of these disturbances. 
And phase two, um, collapse the very end of the uh, 3B period and the beginning of 3C. The most characteristic in this phase is a definite abandonment of low situated settlements and the general shift of numerous elements of the settlement system to defensible places protected mostly by nature rather than by defensive structures. However, the relocation of cemeteries was probably delayed by one generation and this may suggest that initially the refugees hoped to return to their old houses. Some of the fortified citadels and promontory sites mentioned before continued during this phase, but were destroyed and or abandoned before its end. From now onwards, we can speak not only about individual defensible sites, but also about the larger cluster of sites which had to cooperate with each other, at least in respect of security. And here we have a few examples, the cluster of such defensive sites high in the mountains in the Kabusi area, northern coast, and then in the Orino Valley, and the relation, the red dot is the, the, the palatial uh, site, from palatial, the, the late Bronze Age site in the Ascari on the coast, and we see the refugees up high in the mountains, and already um, uh, discussed the, the case of Kafi. Conclusions. The thorough analysis of changes in settlement pattern, including individual settlement location, and organization of settlement systems based on over 120 identified and well-established sites indicates that Crete suffered from precedent security crisis. Apart from the larger centers, such as the area around Consoles, the lowland was deserted. It is hard to believe that such an enormous settlement collapse was irrelevant to the contemporary crisis in the East Mediterranean. To understand this relevance, we have to underline again that the changes were complex with clearly drawn sequence from the growing disturbances to a complete collapse, all happened within one generation. The people involved in the collapse can be classified by different types of sites and their fates in three groups. The aggressors, the victims, and those who fell in between. The identification of the second group, the victims, is the easiest. These were the people climbing incredible defensible sites like earlier shown Catalima, Telniki, Corifi, Kutsunai, Karfi, a series of sites along the southern coast and hiding in the mountainous regions of the island. These were the native Cretans, mostly farmers and shepherds, with some Mycenaean elements gradually coming to the island during the previous 200 years. Their new defensible sites didn't show any social hierarchy, so we have to assume that even if among the refugees were some people, with a higher status in the pre-collapse society, they lost it during the relocation. The scale of this forced settlement, reorganization, and inner migration exceeded anything known in the Cretan history either before or after. At the beginning of the process, around 1200 BC, the relocation to defensible settlements may have been regarded as a temporary response to the collapse of the security, but once years and decades passed, the refugees realized that there was no return to the old Bronze Age settlement pattern. More intriguing, especially for the broader geographical context, however, is the identification of the first group, the aggressors. Looking for them, we should pose the question, who were the people behind the foundations of the fortified citadels and promontory defensive sites, and what was their fate? There are two important differences between these sites and the majority of the 12th century defensible settlements in Crete. The scale and sophisticated character of the fortifications indicate a specialized function related to the military character of the group which built them. The fortifications were not the work of farmers, shepherds, and craftsmen. The groups which built the walls on Castrocephala, Zacros, Catocastelos, and the Lias Tonisi had a military experience and were led or supervised by some authority, a kind of a chieftain. The sites, however, were not a part of a coordinated defensive system. Each site was an individual unit, probably built by and protecting a single independent group, which was under a limited control of the authority in charge, and not a larger unit and not a large territory. Such groups were both the authors and the victims of the vacuum power in the Aegean. The sea orientation of most of the sites further suggests that the subsistence relied heavily on the sea activity. But what kind of sea activity attracted these groups during the time when most of low-length settlements were abandoned and people retreated from the coast, looking for safety in the mountainous regions? It could not be just fishing and oversea trade. Instead, we should rather see these fortified coastal sites 
and promontory sites as bases for piratical activity carried by the marauders or epigons of the warriors from the disciplined tro troops, which were essential elements of the Mycenaean states before the collapse. The cover of their piratical activity cannot be identified yet, but similar groups from all over the Aegean, and not only, may have constituted a part of large-scale migrations heading also to the east, and we can suppose that Cyprus was one of their major targets. It doesn't mean that I see these people as living entirely by sea raiding, as was imputed by uh, on River Dickinson. I pointed instead that a substantial part of their economy was based on sea raiding. Settlement changes, as recorded not only in Crete, but also elsewhere in the Aegean, indicate that similar groups became very numerous and movable in the last decades of the 13th century, probably as the outcome of the collapse of the security system within the Aegean. Castrocephala in Crete shows that the material culture of those people was a Cretan and mainland mixture with some South Italian elements. Considering the structure of the pre-collapse Mycenaean political confederation, we shouldn't expect a pure ethnic character of those people. The Mycenaean mainlanders, the Cretans, the islanders from the Dodecanese and other East Aegean islands, already mixed with the coastal Anatolians, may have joined more or less occasionally and acted together as a unified group. For why, at least? Such movable coastal groups must have got even more mixed on their way. The farther they moved from the place of their origin, the more diluted <coughs> the original ethnic features go. How to interpret the abandonment of those sites? What happened to their inhabitants? A short lifetime of these sites and lack of their equally sophisticated successors indicate that this social organization and ability for similar building projects ended within one or two generations. In the case of Castrocephala, Nasia Kanta suggested that after the destruction of their citadel, people might have emigrated to the east, to Rhodes, then say to Cyprus, to the sites such as Pilakakinokremos, and eventually to the Levantine coast. A small, cor a small correction is needed, however, to such a scenario. The inhabitants of Castrocephala could not be those who built Pilakokinokremos. Both the sites were founded more or less in the same time. And when Castrocephala was abandoned, Pilakokinokremos was evacuated as well. But other similar contemporary splinter groups of the aforementioned regular Mycenaean warrior troops, perhaps much larger and already mixed with people of the Anatolian and perhaps central Mediterranean origin, could indeed sail farther to the east along the south Anatolian coast to Cyprus. They may have been the builders of the fortified sites like Mapa Le Castro and to lesser degree involved in the construction of Pilacotinocremos. To call them Aegean at that time of their landing in Cyprus is probably not quite correct. But to deny the substantial Aegean component of those and similar groups of the so-called Sea Peoples would neglect all the results of our studies on settlement changes in the Aegean region. Thank you very much.